this church, uh, the mission of this church, everything that this church is about, everything that this church is to do, goes around a message, a message, a message of the gospel, that there is good news, that there is hope, that this life isn't the end, and a way has been prepared for us to be saved from the judgment that would have come upon our sins if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. What a message! What an awesome message! And when Jesus was getting up a crew uh, to go take care and tell everybody about this message, He didn't go to the greatest seminaries he didn't go to the, the, the finest speakers in all the land. He went down to the side of the seashore and looked for a few fishermen, just a few fishermen, just common guys. And uh, if you turn over in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4, I want to start in verse 18. I, we're going to head to Jonah, I promise. Uh, but I want to start here with the good old fishermen that Jesus chose. So when you find that, if you'll stand in the honor of uh, reading of God's Word. And it says here in Matthew 4, 18, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. You may be seated. You know, have you ever thought about that? The idea of going out and fishing for men? I mean, what kind of fisherman are you? Are you the type of fisherman that gets out here and you like to catch and then release? Or are you catching them for a reason? Is there a purpose behind what you're doing? Now, I, I promise you, in the idea of being a fisher of men, the idea is not to get them and cook them and eat them. You know, I remember... We were talking about kids this morning. Some of the things they think about, somebody told me, um, they said that there was a, a guy at the back and he was uh, taking up the offering at the end and all the people were gathering together and there was this one little kid that was all upset. And the little kid, he, he ran all over the place looking for his mom and daddy and finally he found him. He was concerned. He thought he had to have a little money to get out of this place. You know, he had to pay to get on out. Kids hear things differently, so I, I, I want you to know right now, kids, if you're hearing this right now, we're not talking about cooking men and eating them later on. Uh, fishers of men is a totally different idea than that. But what if you were such a bad fisher of men that the fish literally ended up eating you? <laughs> you know, that's what happened to old Jonah, wasn't it? The fish ended up eating him, swallowed him, because he didn't want to be a fisher of men. And so the fish came and eat him and brought him to the place where he needed to be. And if you'll turn over to your Bibles here to Jonah chapter 3, Jonah chapter 3, we'll see that Jonah gets a second chance. You know how precious a second chance is? A second chance? An opportunity to do things over. You know, people pay good money to have an opportunity to do things over. Uh, you, you make a mistake and you get into kind of a trouble. Um, people pay all sorts of money to fix everything, put everything the way it ought to be in, uh, the way it should have been. So when God gives a person a second chance, we shouldn't, shouldn't step back from that. We should grab it with both hands and move forward, shouldn't we? Shouldn't we? A second chance that God has given. And that's what happens here. Uh, Jonah's just been spit out of that old well, vomiting out upon the dry land. And here in chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. <laughs> now remember, Jonah was in the belly of the great fish. He was almost, I believe he was dead. And God brought him back to life so he could have a second opportunity to preach the gospel to preach the gospel to these people, to preach the good news, to turn from their sins as God told them. Arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Now, if you had a chance, now I'm not talking about anything else right now, but that witnessing encounter that you had. 
That opportunity that you had, maybe it was a day and you were going uh, through the grocery market or, or you were standing in line while you were getting your meal today and you felt that feeling, hmm, maybe I ought to say something to that individual. Maybe I ought to tell them something. Maybe I'll take that gospel tract that Pastor Scott handed out a couple of weeks ago and put it into somebody's hand. But I held back. I held back. Well, Jonah has been given that second chance. But what we're going to see about Jonah is he really wastes his great opportunity to change not just the people in this one particular time, but to see a change happen throughout generations and generations. You realize that, don't you? When one person, one person is saved in a family, it can affect generations of people, whole generations of people. Whole groups. Some of y'all are sitting here today because there was this one person who went out and found a member of your family and told them about Jesus. That's the reason you're here tonight. That's the reason. But when I look at Jonah, I just begin to think about how much he wasted his chance, his second chance, his second opportunity. And then I thought about another man who was given a second opportunity. And uh, we actually celebrated a day uh, we usually celebrate here in America, uh, St. Patrick's Day, you know. That was yesterday, and everybody thinks it's about leprechauns, it's about green beer, it's about not pinching you when you're not, when, or is it pinching you when you are wearing green, or what is it? That's right. When you're not wearing green, you get pinched. See, everybody thinks that St. Patrick's Day is all about that. And maybe in a way, it has become about all of that. But, but St. Patrick's life is, is almost very similar to what happened to Jonah. Now, he didn't get swallowed by a fish, but he did get taken away from where he wanted to be at. You see, St. Patrick was born around 390 A.D. He was only 16 years old, though, when he was captured by pirates. He lived over in the English, over in England, kind of that, that area over there back then. He was captured by pirates, and he was taken on a ship and sold into slavery at 16 years old. Now, old, old Patrick here, he was your classic, rebellious, non-Christian teenager. He didn't want any of his daddy's religion. He didn't want any of his grandpappy's religion. He didn't want to have any of it all together. All he wanted was his own thing. But then somebody captured him away and carried him off to Ireland where he spent many years working there. His granddaddy was a pastor. His father was a deacon. And, and while he was there living in isolation, Patrick began to understand that his granddaddy and his daddy's religion wasn't such a joke after all. And he began to pray. They took him out in the field and they made him stay out in this field and, and watch over uh, these sheep and different things. And as Patrick was there, he began to pray and talk to God while he was out there. Uh, he endured isolation in the rain and the snow while he was a slave in this condition. And he said uh, he prayed up to 100 prayers each day and another 100 each night. You know, sometimes it takes the bad situation to get you to see what God wants you to see, right? Patrick didn't see it until the bad situation occurred in his life. And so Patrick here, over an island, in his early 20s, God wakes him up one night and speaks to him in a dream and tells him to flee from his slave master and that there was a ship waiting for him. Now here's the, the trick about that. That ship was 200 miles away. 200 miles away. So Patrick just completely believing on what God had told him within his heart, took off. And he began to go across this 200-mile journey on foot on the, the promise of what he felt God had revealed to him in a dream. And when he found himself, he found the boat there waiting for him to go where he needed to be at. It was already prepared for him. Well, when Patrick got back home after this horrible, horrible endeavor, he began to study, he enrolled in a seminary, he became a pastor. And some years later, God spoke to Patrick in a dream again. This time, though, he commanded him to return to Ireland and preach the gospel and plant churches for the same people 
who he had been treated like a dog and been put into slavery. A lot more of that in green beer, isn't it? I got more. I'm going to tell you more. It's really cool. I really, really mean it. But I mean, there's a lot more to that than leprechauns. You know, it would tear him up to think that leprechauns and all this foolishness and nonsense was all around uh, what his life was about now. This man was about uh, preaching the gospel. But Patrick and Jonah, what I want us to see tonight, and they're two second chances. I want to see how they had two very different fishing techniques. And these two different fishing techniques, though they are similar in some ways, folks, there's a real importance in how you do your fishing to me, okay? There's a real importance in how you do it. Because you might see a few fish saved or a few men saved, but if you want to see whole generations saved, it takes a little more work. It takes some differences in your attitude. First of all, you have to want to see people saved. You know, I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, we want to we see the church grow. We want to see people come. We want to do all these things. We don't really want to. We want somebody else to, you know. We want somebody else to get out there and do it. Somebody else to get involved. Well, with Jonah, his want to wasn't working quite as well once he got out of the fish. And, uh, but Patrick's was. So if you look here at verses 3 and 4, it says, So Jonah arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. It was a huge city. Uh, ideas are you could walk around. Some say walk around it would take three days. Some say go through it took three days. But this was a huge, huge city of people. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So, here we have Jonah. He goes in, and God told him to go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. And what did Jonah do? He did the absolute bare minimum that was required of him to do. I'll not do an ounce more. You spit me out of the fish. You give me my life. But now I'm just going to do the absolute bare minimum when it comes to going to this city. If we were to look at it in our terms today, we could say that old Jonah, uh, as our president does at times, got on Twitter and tweeted out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He took his mic and he dropped it and he went home. That's pretty much what happened here. He just come through, he sent out a little tweet, and that was it. It was over. And, and many of us are like Jonah sometimes. We're only willing just to do the very least for God. Now while we're in the whale... Oh God, I'll turn my eyes to your holy temple once again. But once we get out of the well, 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 right? It ain't quite so easy. All them promises made, well, I'll do just what you need me to do. I mean, how far do you want me to go, God? I only know to do how much. But Patrick here, he wasn't the type of man that just did the very least. Now think about this. God told you to go preach the gospel to those who had enslaved you, put you in slavery. So when God told him this in faith, Patrick was 40 years old. He sold all of his possessions. Uh, he sold all the land he had inherited from his father to fund his missionary journey over here to Ireland. He worked as an itinerant preacher and paid large sums of money to the various tribal chiefs just to ensure that he could travel safely to go preach to people who had kidnapped him, who had tried to destroy him. Now, now notice the difference here. Patrick was willing to give up his time. He was willing to give up his finances. And folks, he was willing to give up his life. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference? And now, both of these men, I believe they knew God. I, I, I think they were. They were both prophets of God in this sense, right? My goodness. My goodness. Who do you want to be? You ever wonder that? Do I want to be the one who just does what gets me by? Or do I want to go that extra mile and do, just do all I can? Do all I can for what God has asked me to do. Now, when we do just what will get us by... We'll see a quick change. We'll see a little change that will occur. But when you do more 
than, than, than even ask or think to do what God has asked you to do, you'll see a lasting change that will not end. I promise you. Some people wonder, Scott, why do you do so much at the church? Why do you do so many different things? Why do you, I mean, you're just bivocational. Why do you get involved in all these different things? Because He's worth it. Because billions and billions of people, I can't see them right now, but those people who will come to this church and they'll know about Jesus. Somebody might go for this drive through and know about Jesus. Somebody we might meet at the Easter egg hunt that knows about Jesus. Some little child. Maybe they were witness that little child. That little child might grow up in the next bit of ground. Preach. Millions and millions of people say, why wouldn't we go the extra mile for Jesus? Why wouldn't we go the extra mile for Him? Why wouldn't we put everything that we have into in to, to bringing this awesome message of salvation to the world. Now, here's the thing. We want to make sure we bring the right message. A clear message. How many of y'all remember the Chevy Nova? That was like my first car. I had a Mercury Monarch, and then I had a 79 Chevy Nova. And Novas were rather popular vehicles back in the day. They were real successful in America. I think there might still be a Nova. I'm not sure. Uh, but Chevrolet was encouraged by U.S. sales years ago, and they decided they'd take the Nova throughout the world, and they'd start selling it in all different places. So they sent Novas down to Mexico, and they couldn't figure out, why in the world are we not selling these Novas down in Mexico like we are up here in America? Well, somebody looked it up, and the word Nova means no-go in Spanish. <laughs> it's hard to sell a car that's a no-go, right? I don't think I want that vehicle. Folks, when we bring out the message of the gospel, we want to make sure it's clear. We want to make sure it's understandable. We want to actually not just give the front end of what's going on. We want to disciple people and let them know more about Jesus. Give them more and more information. That's why we have Sunday school. That's why we have discipleship training. So people will learn and know more. Now, look at the Ninevite culture here that, that Jonah was going into. Now the Assyrians here, that's who uh, the Ninevites were, they were Assyrians, they were notorious for their cruelty. They would cut off people's hands, feet, ears, nose, gouge out their eyes, lop off people's head, impale bodies, and peel the skin off of their living victims. That's how cruel and how mean these people were. So Jonah was kind of under a bit of protection when this supernatural thing happens that the God that they serve, which was a great fish, was to spit him out upon this land and he begins walking across their town. They're like, wow, uh, whatever this God is, he sent this fish. And they seen this. Um, one man said uh, in his book, uh, his name was, uh, was uh, Clay Trumbull. And he said this, What better heralding as a divinely sent messenger to Nineveh could Jonah have had than to be thrown up out of the mouth of a great fish in the presence of witnesses, say on the coast of Phoenicia, where the fish god was a favorite object of worship. Such an incident would have inevitably aroused the mercurial nature of oriental observers so that a multitude would be ready to follow the seemingly new avatar of the fish god proclaiming the story of his uprising from the sea as he went on his mission to the city where the fish god had its very center of worship. Now, no, now, notice here the opportunity that Jonah had. He comes and he says, after these so many days, you're all going to be destroyed. He doesn't tell him what to do. He doesn't even tell him about the God that he serves as he goes through here. He really has no care nor concern for these people whatsoever. He's just doing what God said to do. And as he walks through this city, uh, the reason that these Ninevites listened to him uh, was because of this supernatural event, I believe. But no one introduced them to Jonah's God. No one introduced them to him. And some of y'all might not know this, but when you go over to the book of Nahum, the book of Nahum, the book of Nahum is all about how these Ninevites turn away from their great revival. They turn completely away. About 100 to 150 years later, the Ninevites find themselves here and they have completely turned away from this. And they've even got worse than they were before. At this time, they have become brutal in their conquest. They would hang the bodies of their victims on poles a hundred years later and put their skins on the walls of their tents. That's how wicked these Ninevites were. And Nahum, when Nahum 1.14, 
He says, The Lord hath given a commandment concerning thee, talking about the Ninevites, that no more of thy name be sown out of the house of thy gods. Will I cut off graven image and the molten image? I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. Thou art vile. Now, out of that region today, you'll find ISIS coming out of that region. Now, what would have happened if Jonah had took a few more minutes and instead of just giving a tweet, he might at least give a Facebook post and tell him a little bit about his Hebrew God? If he just went a little bit extra, he gave just a little bit more to tell a little bit more to disciple these people. You know, the only thing that, that kind of gives you just an ounce of hope here that at least these people in this generation were saved, if you'll look over here in verse uh, 5, it says, So the people of Nineveh believed God. The, they believed God. They didn't believe Jonah. They believed God. And there was a change in them that did occur. There was a great change that occurred from that moment. But think about that. The change that happened was kind of superficial because the people in the place didn't change at times later. Now think about this. Imagine our politicians. They get up and they end abortion tomorrow. Abortion is ended. They end homosexual marriage. They put prayer back in school and they call upon the entire nation to repent in sackcloth and ashes. Now God didn't bring the destruction on the Ninevites at this time. He didn't bring the destruction upon their lives and who they were. But here's the problem. If no one's really saved, it will not make a difference. There has to be a change on the inside. Not just an outward change. I think that's what we want sometimes. We don't really want to see people saved. We just want to see our surroundings change. We want to see the world the way it was in 1950 again. Jesus didn't come to give you the world back in 1950 again. He came to give you see souls saved. That's what Jesus came to do. And you know why it was different back then? Because there were more souls that were saved. I don't care about changing a hundred laws. I don't care about who's the president. I just care about how many people say. That's all that matters. Because you know what? You wouldn't fool a saved individual that would come in and start preaching about homosexual marriage or about abortion. Because a saved individual would know that's wrong. They wouldn't want to have that, right? What is the problem in America? We have too few people saved. People need to be saved. The gospel needs to be preached. It needs to be clear. We don't want them to hear that this is a no-go when we're out here. We want them to hear that it's the truth and this is you need to come. Come, receive this awesome gift. Well, the same thing <coughs> more or less happened. But Patrick made a lasting change because he went deep. He even put aside his own thoughts because all that mattered was the message that was going to be preached. The Irish culture at that time, they were even worse, I guess, than these Ninevites. They were a bunch of drunken, fighting, perverted pagans who basically had sex with anyone and worshipped anything around them. This was who the Irish culture was back then. They had no city centers, no national government. They had about 150 warring clans that were always hating one another. Before they would go into battle, they would partake in wild orgies and then run into battle naked, screaming like they were demon-possessed as they fought. You want to talk a bad situation to get involved in. Patrick walked into it, right? And these were the people who had enslaved him earlier on. But Patrick didn't just do the bare necessities. His strategy was completely unique. He was a, a missionary to these people. And he tried to communicate the gospel to them in their culture, to who they were. And he would actually use both musical and visual arts to show them the gospel. You know, sometimes I think we're afraid to do something different because it's something different. Folks, if it causes something different to get the gospel message to somebody that can't understand it just by the way I'm regularly doing it, we're going to change it to make it something different. Sometimes people are more visually oriented. Sometimes people are more oriented by reading or studying. Folks, I just want you to know the gospel, and we should want them to know no matter what it is. The church back home got all upset at him because of the way he was trying to preach the gospel to these pagans down here. He would find a group. 
he would find them and he would present Jesus to them. He would baptize converts. And then he'd hand over the converts to a trained pastor who was one of their own group. And he repeated that process as he went over and over again. Some of you may have heard that St. Patrick is the one who drove the snakes out of Ireland. And the atheists mock and they say, Ah, there never was any snakes in Ireland. Ha <laughs> ha, look at foolishness, right? You know what kind of snake he's talking about? That same one talked to Eve back in the garden. He drove the devil out of Ireland is what he did. Went down there and he preached this awesome message of the gospel. And he seen the people changed. Changed in such a way from the inside out. And not just the outside change that it seems to happen here in Jonah's day. And that's why there's still a Celtic cross that hangs in Ireland. Now they're not perfect. There's quite a bit of Catholicism. They're in confusion in some ways. But Patrick made a real difference, folks. He made a real difference to that group. A real difference. And we see here that this group, they repented in sackcloth and ashes. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that He had said that He would do unto them, and He did it not. <laughs> he did it not. Folks, do you want to see the culture really changed? Go to the individual. And just tell them the gospel. Offer it to them. A good fisherman will look like the master fisherman. You hear me? That's what a good fisherman does. They says here they re God repented of the evil. That, in case you get confused, that doesn't mean that God had any evil about him. It means he turned from doing what he was going to do to them because he wanted the gospel preached to them. It's kind of a way of speech. And we see God's mercy in that, right? 2 Peter 3 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He cared about these people. Jonah would step away, and we're going to see in the next few Sundays, we're going to see that he would sit up on a hill and actually wait for these people to die. He could care less about the people down there that he was preaching to. Jonah didn't look like the one that he was following. You hear me? You want to know if you're really doing things right. Look at yourself and look at your actions and then compare them to Jesus Christ. Putting up with a lot of junk in your life? You think Jesus did? Going through a struggle in your life? You think Jesus did? Spending all day and all night preaching the gospel? You think Jesus did? Look at it. His care, His concern. You want your life to look like Him. Now old St. Patrick, he gave his life to those people who enslaved him until he died at the age of 77 years of age. He's seen untold thousands of people convert. Uh, many of those tribes became substantially Christian. He trained a thousand pastors. He planted 700 churches. He's the first person in history who ever took a stand against slavery. Now listen, do you think Patrick looked like Jesus? What did he do? He came and he witnessed to his enemies. You want to know your Christian faith? Go witness to your enemy. Go witness that person that's about as mean as all get out and you really don't like a whole lot. Jonah showed how he was, right? He didn't want to go down there, but he went ahead and did it. And y'all can do that. You can say, I'll go talk to my old enemy. I'll go give him the gospel. Now I'm just done with him, right? I've had enough of that. But what did old Patrick do? He went in there and spent his entire life, and he looked like Jesus. Matthew 5, 43-45, Jesus said this, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye might be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. Folks, would you spend the rest of your life Going to witness to people that enslaved you and treated you like a dog. Jesus come down out of heaven and he came down here to spend his life giving it to save the souls of all the world. All his enemies. 
That's who our Savior is. That's what He done. Patrick said this, I am a servant of Christ to a foreign nation for the unspeakable glory of life everlasting, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. When Jesus comes into your life, you're going to be a different person. You're going to be different. Folks, I have found that when you're loving your enemies and you go to preach the gospel to them, you'll feel the protection of God when you're living like Jesus Christ. You will. When you are doing everything in your power to be like Jesus Christ, you'll just have a peace over you that just passes all understanding. All understanding. And you'll be able to go to preach maybe to ISIS. Now, I wouldn't advise it. <laughs> but hey, hey, if God tells you to go preach to ISIS, you need to go preach to ISIS. I know many of us said, please, Lord, don't let me have to do that. I tell you, if God tells you, then you're going to be okay. We would love for you to come meet us at one of our regular meetings in person. Sunrise is located directly off exit 23 off of Interstate 81 in Tennessee. We regularly meet Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. for small group Bible studies and then at 10.50 a.m. for worship. We also meet Sunday evenings for worship at 6.30 p.m. and Wednesday nights for discipleship training at 6.30 p.m. We would love for your family to meet our family and again, Thank you for watching and sharing with others.